Well, good morning, guys. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, we're live, uh, live streaming. And uh, before we begin, uh, Pastor Dave Pross. Dave, quick announcement, something that uh, some of you guys might be interested in. I don't know if it's, you can try that. Hi, guys. Good morning. Can you hear me? That's not on. That's just talk on. loud. Good morning. Just talk Good loud. Good morning. Um, I just want to let you know, um, there's, you've probably heard this, maybe you haven't. Um, this fall in October, there's going to be a mission trip to uh, Cleveland. I know there's a promotion going to Mexico, but there's one to Cleveland. Um, my wife and I are co-leading that mission. Weekend trip, go Friday, live downtown. Help out in different places. Get to know. It's, a, it's supporting Envision Cleveland. So I've got an information sheet in case you're at all interested. And um, it's October 21st to 23rd of, of, of October. 21st through 23rd. So anyway, it'll be a, it's a culture thing. You know, if we live out here in the suburbs, and it's different down there. So um, that'd be uh, something you might consider. Pray about it. All right, thanks, Dave. Registration is open now. You'll, you'll be hearing more about this over the next couple of weeks from the front. It's on the Grace Church website. Great opportunity for ministry. Um, we, we have reverted back to the original name Band of Brothers. Any, is that good? And part of the reason is I think that's a great name for men's ministry. That's also my favorite documentary ever about Easy Company. Uh, anyway, so we're officially Band of Brothers, and um, going back to, to books of the Bible, or maybe an occasional Christian book that, that we get a consensus on, yeah, this is relevant to us, we'd like to, to study this, but we'll be doing books of the Bible, and yes, sir? Toaster's working. Toaster's working. All right, good job. Disaster averted. But anyway, looking forward to being in here with you guys on a regular basis, and I have a, a great teaching team of guys you know and already appreciate. Pastor Dave will be uh, rotating in, uh, Bob Widow, Chaplain Bob Widow will be rotating in, and Mark Ludwig when, when he's in town here and not gallivanting on the beach in Florida, um, he'll, be, he'll be part of the teaching team. So going through the, the book of James... And a very, very practical, hands-on New Testament book about how do you live out the Christian life in the nitty-gritty of everyday life at street level. Not a lot of, of theology in James, like uh, Paul's epistles, but uh, a lot of very practical teaching about how do, we, how do we live in a way that's consistent with our identity in Christ and our, our Christian profession. So let me pray quickly, and then uh, you have your handouts there. Um, I, I am confident that you men can walk, chew gum, eat breakfast, and take notes at the same time. So, yeah. so, so, so let's pray. Lord, we open our minds and hearts to you now, and we invite you by your Holy Spirit, who, who is our teacher, we invite you to speak to us, speak to our hearts, for Jesus' sake, amen. Okay, so James 1, and uh, James doesn't mess around. He goes right into one of the most difficult issues of life. How do we handle suffering without being crushed, without losing our faith, without becoming bitter against God? Like Job, remember the immortal words of Job's wife when their, everything caved in, their world fell apart? What did she say to her husband? What was her advice? Curse, Curse God and die. Now, we, we can all understand why she would feel that way. So James, he goes right to this issue that has destroyed the faith of millions of people who have suffered terribly. How do we, how do we handle suffering as God's people? How do we handle it successfully so that we draw closer to God rather than become, becoming bitter and drifting away from God. So James is kind of the pro book of Proverbs of the New Testament. It's like the Old Testament wisdom literature. It's all about how do we practically live out our Christian life in a way that's wise 
in a broken world. And it includes 55 commands and exhortations. That, that's more than almost, uh, I think, any other book of the New Testament. 55 different commands and exhortations. And what's the theme? How does saving faith, if you have genuine saving faith in Christ, how does that display itself in your everyday behavior? So just a little bit about the background. James was one of the younger brothers of Jesus, actually a half-brother, same mother, different father. And um, do, do you think that uh, Mary and Joseph ever revert when their younger kids were misbehaving? You think they ever blurted out, why can't you be like your big brother Jesus, you know? Well, he, big brother Jesus had an unfair advantage, I think, Right. But anyway, uh, younger brother did not believe in Jesus during his lifetime, was embarrassed by Jesus, tried to get Jesus to stop doing his public ministry. But 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that after Jesus was raised from the dead, he appeared to Peter personally. We can understand why to restore him. Then he appeared to James. <laughs> can you imagine the shock of here? J James didn't believe in Jesus during his lifetime but his big brother rises from the dead and comes hey james how you doing little brother anyway that might have been his conversion right there but james obviously grew rapidly and he rose to become the leader of the growing church in jerusalem and later in acts 15 james presides over this jerusalem council so, so James was spiritually transformed and went on to become a, a great leader in the early church. James might be the earliest New Testament book written. It was almost certainly written before any of the four Gospels were written. And some scholars think maybe Galatians was written early, but James may well have been the first book, New Testament book, written, filled with practical wisdom for you and I. So let's, let's dive in. How do we suffer? How do we survive, not just survive suffering without becoming bitter, losing our faith? How, how can we thrive? How can we benefit from suffering? There's a guy named John Green has written a bunch of uh, novels, and he wrote an essay, an article called Googling Strangers was the name of the article. And he talks about how when he was in his early 20s, he was thinking maybe he was called to full-time ministry. And so for six months, he got a job as a student chaplain at a children's hospital in preparation for a life devoted to ministry. One night, he was alerted by the emergency to the, uh, department that a three-year-old child had been brought in with severe burns, third-degree burns over most of its body. Despite the severity of the injury, the child was conscious and in terrible pain, the anguish was overwhelming. The smell of the burns, the piercing screams that accompanied this little boy's every breath. Somebody shouted, chaplain, the scissors behind you. And in a daze, I brought them the scissors. Someone shouted, chaplain, the parents. And I realized that next to me, the little boy's parents were screaming, trying to get at their child. But the doctors and paramedics and nurses needed enough space to work. So I had to ask the parents to, to step back. Next thing I knew, I was in the family room in the emergency department, the room where they put you on the worst night of your life. It was quiet except for the crying of the couple of, across from me. They sat on opposite sides of the couch, elbows on their knees. During, any, during my training, they told me that half of marriages end within a couple years of losing a child. Weekly, I asked the parents if they wanted me to pray. The woman sh shook her head no. The doctors expected the child to die, and later, when, when John went into the break room to get a cup of coffee, he saw the doctor, her face hovering over a trash can that she'd been vomiting into. She dried heat, dry heat for a while, and then she said, that kid's going to die, and I know his last words. I know the last thing he'll ever say. When John finished that six-month chaplaincy, he chose not to go to seminary. And over time, his belief in Christianity faded due to his inability to cope with the suffering he witnessed that night. Still, he continued to pray for the boy and ask for mercy. And his words were, whether I believed in God isn't really relevant. 
I do believe, however tenuously, in mercy. Just one little sliver of the suffering in our world. We know what's going on in Ukraine. This is one of the biggest obstacles to people accepting Christianity. And it's one of the biggest obstacles for Christians themselves when they go through this kind of suffering. And maybe some of you in this room have been through, you know, horrible, terrible suffering. So this is the first thing James is going after. Massive problem, huge issue. And he gives us some divine wisdom, kind of a a God's perspective on suffering and how do we face it successfully? How should we respond to it? So let's read uh, James 1. We'll read 1 down to 4. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, his view of his big, big brother radically changed as a result of meeting his resurrected brother, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations. He's talking about Jewish Christians who were scattered to the Mediterranean world as a result of the outbreak of persecution. Acts chapter 8 talks about that terrible outbreak of persecution. Many of the early Christians, many of them Jewish believers, were scattered. That's who he's writing to. Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds, Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. And perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So you'll notice he says, when you face trial, not if you face trial. That's pretty important, right? When you face trials, and he says these trials are are of many different diverse kinds, okay? Um, Acts chapter 14, uh, Paul and Barnabas had been going on their first missionary journey, and at the end of their missionary journey, they went back and visited some of these young, fledgling churches that they had started. So these churches are filled with young Christians, maybe one, two years old in the faith. And Luke gives us a summary of the message that they were preaching to these young Christians. What was the summary of a much longer message? (laughs) Through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Now, I'm sure that's not all they said. I'm sure they had a a lot of positive, encouraging words about being new creations in Christ and being the beloved sons of God and heirs of eternal glory, and we're going to experience infinite joy. But during this short life, through many tribulations, all of us will enter the kingdom of heaven. So so let's give the Bible credit for this. The Bible is realistic. It's not this pie in the sky. The the Bible is honest and realistic about the, the trials of life, the difficulties of life that we all face. And he says, trials and testings of many different kinds. Some of us go through a lot of physical suffering. When we get older, we'll go through that. Some of us, a lot of emotional pain, a lot of relational suffering, you know, difficult marriages. You know, I'm at the age now where a lot of my peers, you know, our hearts are, are burdened for our children. Some of our children have walked away from God. Um, it could be relational pain, financial ups and downs. We know what, you know, many Christians around the world live in abject poverty, not sure where their next meal is coming from. Many diverse, different kinds. And when you become a follower of Christ, you are actually bringing on yourself some voluntary suffering. In other words, Jesus said, if anybody wants to come after me, let him die to himself. Let him take up his cross daily. Let him follow me. Now, part of our voluntary suffering is the pain of dying to ourself, dying to our self, self-lordship every day. The ongoing pain of daily repentance, saying no to short-term pleasures that are sinful, and saying yes to Jesus. And I think it's, it's uh, pretty clear that our, our secular society today, which, you know, has thrown overboard any belief in an afterlife or heaven or what the Bible says. Our secular society today, and even some American Christians, if they're not in the word on a regular basis, we have a, tend to have a very poor theology of suffering. 
if this short life is all there is, you don't exist, you're born, you, you come to this, life goes by fast, and then you cease to exist again, then if your life here is not very happy, if you're not able to grab for the gusto, if, if, if suffering comes into your life, you're going to be in despair because this is the only one shot you have, this one short life. Okay, we have a biblical perspective. We, we, we have a different perspective to that. Uh, but anyway, would, would we not all agree that when we suffer, that's a test. Uh, are we going to draw closer to God and cling to him and, and get strength from him? Or are we going to become bitter and turn our backs? I lived in Hawaii for the last five years before I moved back here to, to God's country. And uh, there was a guy that I knew in, in, in Kailua who had grown up at a good Baptist church there. His family went to that church. He was a committed Christian. He was such a committed Christian. He felt God calling him to reach Muslims. And so he went with pioneers to Indonesia and became the leader of a church planting team reaching out to Muslims. And you know what, what I'm convinced, having been a missionary for eight years, you know what Satan's number one way of, of, of going after missionaries is? If it's not problems that their kids are having, it's conflict with other missionaries. A lot of missionaries are type A. You know, they're red on the SDI, they're driven, they're strong leaders. They get out there, put them on a team with four or five fellow missionaries, and Satan wants to get them at each other's throats. That's what happened. He was the team leader. The team imploded because he went back to, to, to Hawaii, a broken man. In fact, he was so shattered by this that he said, I'm not sure I even believe in God anymore. And, you know, suffering is a test. And so James is giving us some, some guidance here. How, how, do you, how do you pass that test? So James indicates that God's people can see things differently, that, that a wise, a good, a loving, a sovereign God wants to use our suffering for our good, to toughen us up, to, to, to draw us closer to him and to closer dependence on him and, and to create an inner toughness, a perseverance, a, you know, a, a stick to itiveness as a result. Of those trials. So how can we successfully face suffering? Well, one way is verse two. He says, God's purpose for suffering is always for your good. It's always for your growth. It's, it, it, God is not sadistic. God, we know that from the cross, right? God demonstrated his love for us. While we were still spitting in his face, Jesus died for us to open up the gates of heaven. So we know that God is good. We know that God is loving. And God's purpose is always, it, there's no purposeless suffering. God's purpose is always to, beneficial to us. To, 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 he's looking out for our eternal good, our eternal well-being. And when we respond to suffering in faith, then other people benefit from that as well. So look at verse 5. We'll read verse 5 through 8. If any of you lacks wisdom, and he's talking here not about wisdom in general, but wisdom in how to face suffering. That's what he's talking about. If any of you lacks wisdom in how to face suffering, then, then come to God, beseech God, ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will, it will be given to him. But whenever he asks, he must believe and not doubt, because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That man should not think that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in what he does. How do we face suffering successfully? By taking a wider, longer view. And if we take an eternal perspective, if we look at the bigger picture, that involves a loving Heavenly Father who trains who shapes, who disciplines his kids to help them mature. And he does it for our good. When, when we take that view, and God wants to help you through the suffering. He wants to help you through that season. He wants to give you wisdom. So come to him and trust him and ask for it. 
when we consider all those things, we can understand why, he's, why, 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 why James said, consider it joy because God is working not just for your temporal good, he's, he's working for your eternal good, for your eternal joy. And that's why he allows the suffering to come into your life. Hebrews 12 says the same thing in different words. Talks about how God disciplines those whom he hates and he's ticked off with. Is that what it says? Who does God discipline? Those whom he loves. You're his beloved sons. He wants the best for you, not just short term, but throughout eternity. All discipline for the moment seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who've been trained by it afterwards, <clears throat> it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. God disciplines us for our gain, for our benefit. You remember the famous quote by uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn? He was a Russian communist, grew up in Russia, uh, fought in World War II, and he was all in on communism, and he became a leader. Um, he took delight in, you know, being cruel to people that weren't towing the party line. Well, he got arrested. He wrote a letter to a friend that said something slightly critical about Joseph Stalin. For that, he got thrown into the gulag, thrown an eight-year sentence, hard labor in the gulag. And what happened to him suffering in that prison? What men meant for evil, God meant for good. And he wrote this celebrated uh, book, The Gulag Archipelago, archipelago about the brutality of stalin in the brutality of communism and this is what he said about his experience it was only when i lie there on rotting prison straw that i sensed within myself the first stirrings of good gradually it was disclosed to me that the line separating good and evil passes not through states that's what communism taught you know, we're good because we're bringing the working man up and making everybody evil and capitalism is horrible and people are going to suffer under capital. No, the line separating good from evil doesn't go through different political approaches, nor between political parties, but the line dividing good and evil goes right through every human heart. We're all a little bit good because we're created in the image of God and we're all evil because we have a sinful nature. That is why I turn back to the years of my imprisonment and I say sometimes to the astonishment of those around me, bless you prison. My soul was nourished there. And so I say without hesitation, bless you prison for having been in my life. And as a result of that time in prison, he became a believer in Jesus Christ. And then he emigrated to America and he gave some famous well-known speeches uh, in places like Harvard and other places where he says, you know what's wrong with the modern secular West? You have forgotten God. That's the root of all your troubles. How did he come to that view? In prison, suffering. It was through suffering that God opened his eyes, opened his heart, and he came to faith. So God's purposes are good. Bottom of page one, God's word is filled with references to the positive effects of enduring separate, uh, painful circumstances, painful experiences. And here James highlights the effect of spiritual maturity. That, that's, the effect, that's the result. God is producing spiritual maturity, dogged perseverance, so that we are mature and complete, lacking nothing. So trials, suffering, they turbocharge, they accelerate, they turbocharge the normal process of spiritual growth. Remember what C.S. Lewis said about pain? Pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Um, it, it's easy to kind of gradually tune God out, right? I know how God can get your attention faster than anything else. Pain, pain, because that, that, that wakes us up. It causes us to think, oh my goodness, is God trying, what is God trying to tell me? 
He's probably trying to tell you, you're drifting away from him. Come back. Re recommit yourself to me. That's what James is saying here. And he says, pray because God is generous. And, and literally, he says, God is, is generously and continuously doing good to those who love him. That's God's nature. Um, there's no, no that, that's God's default setting is he's constantly giving good gifts. He's constantly doing good to his children. He's constantly answering our prayers. So when you're suffering, lean into God, draw near, pray for wisdom, pray for strength, pray for grace, pray for perseverance, because God delights to give that to you. But he says, there's a condition to answered prayer, right? The New Testament is filled with, if you, God want, if you want God to answer your prayers, there are conditions we have to meet. This is just one more condition. And the condition, I mean, James sounds a little harsh here, but remember, the first thing he says about asking God for wisdom is God is continually being generous and giving good gifts to us. He wants to answer that prayer. But what's the condition? Well, if you're a Sunday morning Christian only, if you if you're, have divided loyalties, if you have one foot in the church and one foot in the world, if you're a half-hearted Christian, don't expect God to answer. Um, you, you, you've got to be all in. You don't have to be perfect. None of us is perfect. But he says you, you have to be sincerely committed to Jesus, wanting to please him, wanting to go however haltingly and imperfectly we do it. So that's the condition. You know, it says that in other places as well. Uh, in other words, he said, don't expect a million dollar answer to a 10 cent prayer. OK, there are conditions to answered prayer. And one of them is that you're you're sincerely wanting to grow in grace and to draw closer to God and live in a way that pleases him. So so that's the condition. But remember, God disciplines those whom he loves. If you're without discipline, I think the King James says you're a bastard. You're, you're an illegitimate child. You know, if you're not experiencing any any growth producing pain in your life, maybe you're not even saved is what Hebrews is saying. If you're God's child, you're, there's going to be some spankings. What, what good parent doesn't discipline his children? That's, not, that's pain. That's suffering. God is doing his refining, purifying work in you. And there's joy on the other end of that pain. If you persevere, there's long-term joy on the other end. So real quickly, wrapping it up, why do we face suffering? We'll bring in some other scripture. Why, why is God allowing that suffering to come into our life? Well, God uses it to bring about a, a greater degree of, of brokenness in our heart, to soften our hearts towards him, to, to draw our hearts out in greater uh, devotion and commitment and dependence upon him, desperate dependence upon him. And, and that, that is going to benefit us, uh, not just in time, but in eternity. I love what the psalmist said. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. I, I think probably every one of us in this room could probably say that. Suffering purifies our character. It, it, it intensifies our trust in God, our reliance upon him, so that our lives become more pleasing to him and we gain greater eternal rewards. God is concerned about your eternal joy. We're concerned about our temporal joy, and understandably so. And thank God we do get some of that. You know, we, we, the, we get a foretaste of joy in this life, but it's mingled with the pain and the suffering of living in a broken world and experiencing God's chastening, disciplining work in our life. And I love 2 Corinthians 4, 17, because it's that eternal perspective for our light and momentary trouble. See that eternal perspective? This is a great verse to memorize, guys, especially when you're going through it. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory 
that far outweighs all of these temporal troubles. How, how, are our, how, how is our pain achieving that for us? By driving us closer to God, by getting our attention, by causing us to do some soul searching. Lord, is there something I, I need to repent of? And, and it, suffering has a way of getting us on our knees and, and just getting us to return to wholehearted devotion and trust in Jesus. And that will benefit us for all eternity. Third one is steadfastly enduring pain as a believer honors Jesus. It shows a lost world and it shows Christians around us that Jesus is worth more than temporal comfort. When, when we go through suffering and, and we hang in there and continue to love Jesus and walk with Jesus, we're showing the world that we love Jesus more than we love our temporal comfort. That we're going to hang in there because Jesus is worthy of us to suffer for. Um, I went to a Christian college, a Bible college. We had required chapel every day, Monday through Friday. And they would bring in some really good speakers. And I think maybe the best, the most powerful speaker I heard in, as an undergrad was a lady named Helen Rosevere. Anybody ever hear of Helen Rosevere? British lady, grew up, became a missionary nurse. She became a nurse, became a missionary nurse in uh, the, the Belgian Congo, which is now, I think, the, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Became a missionary nurse there. This was in the early 60s, mid-60s. The Congo Rebellion took place. A revolution took place. And there was a lot of violence, especially violence against Westerners. And she was brutalized and she was gang raped during that rebellion. Went back to England to, to recover and whatnot, but didn't lose her faith. The suffering drew her even closer to God. And she wrote several books and spoke all over the world. And the quote I'll never forget, she talked about her experience. And she said when she went back to England, People, the question people kept asking was, was it worth it? Are you, do you regret going to serve there? Was it worth it? She said, you're asking the wrong question. The question is not, was it worth it? The question is, is he worthy? That's the question. And she said, yes, I don't regret it. Jesus is worthy of our total commitment, even if that results in something. Don't, don't you think the Christians in Ukraine are asking that question and, and answering it the same way. He is worthy of our continued faith and devotion despite the suffering. And then the last one, enduring suffering with God's sustaining health is a powerful witness to a lost world and even to our fellow Christians. Uh, it's a powerful witness to a lost world and it, it fits us, it equips us to encourage and build up our fellow Christians. Second Corinthians one, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the father of compassion, the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves receive from God. When you're going through deep suffering, don't you want to be around other Christians who have been through deep suffering and kept their faith and that will inspire you and encourage you and show, you know what, God, God can help me. If God can help them, God can get me through this as well. So God is there. God wants to be there for you to help you endure. And some of you guys are going through deep waters right now. Lean into your heavenly father. Lean, draw near to him. Lean into community with others who have been through suffering. And there is joy. There's eternal joy on the far end if you will persevere through it. Let me circle back to my story about the six-month chaplain guy that lost his faith. Well, here's the end of the story. Decades later now, John, that young chaplain that was in there that night, he decided he would try to contact that three-year-old boy, he, he, to see if he even was still alive, if he had survived. So he Googled the name of the burn boy, and he discovered that not only was he alive and well, but he was thriving. Uh, even though he had dealt for years with the linger of, lingering effects of the fire that seared his skin that night, 
So in a recent podcast, John, this novelist, connected with the boy on his podcast, now grown up, and uh, is, so he interviewed the guy on his podcast. The suffering of that ter terrible night in the ER kicked off a series of events that eventually led that little boy and his parents to find solace in the Christian faith. The young man and his family are today devout Christians, and it's clear from the conversation that this little boy now grown up wants John to return to his faith. Come back. Come back to a good and a loving God who uses suffering for our eternal good. Amen. Let's pray and then we'll, we'll kick it to the table discussion. Lord, th this is kind of a bitter pill to swallow because suffering does test our faith and suffering turns people away from you and suffering certainly is a weapon that the atheists throw at us. But Lord, you, you're a wise and a good and a powerful and a loving heavenly father. And Lord, you want to use suffering to refine us like gold, to make us like pure gold, uh, to make us stronger, to make us more Christ-like. So Lord, help us to respond by drawing near to you and getting into your word and leaning into, into community. And Lord, help us to, to be a, a blessing and an encouragement to others as they go through suffering. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, uh, table discussion will come up and uh, close in about a half hour.